what's an example of a female like action movie martial arts icon where it's not invisible and then what's an example of a male icon where it is invisible so i guess it man would qualify but i don't know i haven't thought about that so that's why that's interesting and then a female icon where it's not invisible i mean i see gina carano there but if you watch haywire i mean she's walking around in a cocktail dress and mm. she's fighting in that could just be a pretty girl it's like what what's the marker for visibility in a woman if the marker for a dude is all the muscles is but the marker muscles? is that i think that if it, outside of this outside of films outside of the cinema the the marker is often in it's sartorial often it's you, you know you, what are you wearing you, you're you're wearing these you might be wearing this t-shirt or you might be wearing one of my many like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu t-shirts, which kind of, it's just puts the word out there. What are those other ones that, the, um, th what's that UFC one? Tap out. That you're wearing tap out or something like that. Or and it's, you're kind of like trying to signify, um, you know, you're, try, you're trying to, you're, you're trying to send out messages about who you are. Um, and I, I mean, I was, I love the fact that, I mean, we, we both, not everyone here knows Megan Morris, but Megan Morris, professor of, you know, gender and cultural studies in Sydney. And she always wears like world gym clothes. <laughs> I just love that because I, you know, I would never wear world gym clothes, even though I desperately want to deep down because, um, because I'm not like a big bodybuilder and it, it it's 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 kind of like I'm just a crap bodybuilder. I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm like, I, I couldn't wear it, but she can wear it because she's a woman and, and i just want to bring this up i don't know i i don't know if i've ever seen or heard you talk about it i don't know if you've even seen it but do you know the recent movie the art of self-defense with jesse eisenberg yeah it's, yeah i loved it that is that kind of bears on that too where he's kind of at that crossroads like okay i'm training martial arts so people don't pick on me and rob me but how's anybody gonna know that i do martial arts so he starts making like belts that he can wear in the real world. So he goes to work with his yellow belt on, <laughs> this stuff like that. Like, how do we communicate this besides just striking a pose in the street? Yeah. So yeah, just interesting stuff that I found reading that part. Yeah. That part. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of that in around martial arts. I mean, with the. Yeah, I, I don't want to get in, into it too much, but yeah, pe people want to communicate. They they de they're desperate to signify. Unless unless they are like you know. Um, there's a scene in Ghost Dog, you know, in Forrest Whitaker's walking around being all ghost dog and enigmatic and kind of ninja-like, right? And he's walking around and uh, and he sees an old man with his shopping bags, his grocery, the classic American, like, you know, like brown paper bags. And some some young punk comes up and puts his hand on his shoulder, he's going to rob him. But the old man turns out to be a martial arts expert, and kicks him in the head and stamps on him. And you're like, yay, because that's the martial arts fantasy, isn't it? And that's also the that's also the the, the 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 genuinely fantastic feminist narrative about things like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You know, the story of a man goes to attack a woman or a girl. She's a she's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and she chokes him out, and she's got him trapped in a she's just got a leg strapped around his leg while she phones the police and says, "I've got this loser here." I mean, that's the that that's the ultimate kind of emancipatory sort of physical feminist narrative, isn't it? And even jumping in to connect, if I start talking about MMA, I might not be able to stop, but it does at least connect to the kind of new, I don't know if myth is the right word, or the new kind of sense of understanding or the new sort of common practice, the idea that once the UFC got so popular and people can be doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Muay Thai or whatever, the idea that you don't really want to pick fights anymore, because for all I know, this guy's a cage fighter, he's going to arm bar me. It's like now everyone realizes that it's not going to be obvious and there is a sort of invisibility to this but yeah another there's, thing, there's, a flip, mean, there's a flip side to it as well i mean i i really do believe in the the kind of i, I that, so there's a a writer called martha mccoy and she r writes books about physical feminism and about women's self-defense in the states so it's all really serious it's all guns and all that kind of really serious shit that we just don't have in britain currently which is good um and she talks about it as, you know, to, to be able to, um, so in Martha McCoy's argument, the divide, the concept that divides masculinity and femininity is aggression. That's the marker of whether you're feminine or not and, and how you are aggressive, right? That's the, def that's the defining thing. 
Um, and so, so her argument is one of like, you know, all women should learn self-defense. All women should, should learn how to use their bodies in ways that are traditionally male dominated. And I do think that um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and, and other forms of grappling and so on are potentially emancipatory for women in this way. But you've got to remember the flip side and the flip side as one person once kind of came over to me at a conference and was uh, we're talking about jujitsu and feminism and he just went they call it the rapist's art because if you're a man in your brazilian jujitsu then you know how to control other people's bodies you can pin them down you can control them so it, like it's potentially it's a pharmacon in jack derrida sense it's poison and it's medicine it's you know it, it's a it's a rather complex situation nothing is straightforwardly emancipatory or straightforwardly feminist or straightforwardly good um I think. So you know, there, there's always a dark side to these things, always. A lot of times when reading certain points of yours, I always have the thought, context is king. That's just one of those nice things. Yeah. But to go in a different direction, because I know we can talk about a lot of stuff for a long time. One thing that I did want to ask you about, because it comes up in different places, and it's sometimes it's pitched as if it's a problem. At other times, it seems like it's pretty neutral, or at the very least, you're not really making a value judgment. But it sparked a thought to me where if, at all, if there is any kind of judgment for you, it seems to be either a negative or a potentially negative thing. Whereas for me, I kind of, I guess, took a glass half full, saw it as a positive thing. But the idea of martial arts being represented as comedic or stupid as the source of a joke, a reason to make fun of it or the people who do it. That kind of idea that made me think, I think it's, isn't it Karl Marx who did the first, this tragedy then his farce? I think so it, that made it me might think, have been Feuerbach, I don't know, but I think it was Marx. So that, that line was in my head and it made me think that it seems like you could make, I guess, a positive spin argument that I never really had a problem with like the comedic representations of martial arts because for me, I can see that kind of comedy as like the sign that it made it, as the <laughs> sign that it's there to be made as a joke. So it made me think like certain things and martial arts is the case study here yeah. that it's like first as genuine, then as parody. Yeah. So it's like when you had that boom in the late 90s and early 2000s of like spoof movies, so it's like, you know that the hood movies, like Boys in the Hood and Juice and stuff like that, you know that those made a huge impact in American cinema because then we can have something like Don't Be a Menace to South Central. When you know that these teen slasher movies made a huge impact with Scream, and I know what you did last summer, then we can get scary movie. So when we get stuff like Kung Pao and the goofy kind of comic stuff from cartoons like Lizzie McGuire and Hey, or kid shows like Lizzie McGuire cartoons like Hey Arnold, it seems at some points, I think you're kind of guarding against like, well, these things aren't stupid. So you, we, can, we can do comedy about them, but they're not stupid. So well, it seems like there's that. But I do kind of have, I guess, a benevolent or positive sense like, hey, it's a source of comedy. That means martial arts has penetrated this far that we can do it in this kind of popular context. Just wanted yeah. to know your I know I've always, I mean, I, that, the stuff when I write about um, martial arts comedy that, that or, or people laughing about martial arts, that was in one of the other books. I don't think I write about it so much in this book, but in this book, I do take, I wanted to take some time to write about the Monty Python um, lap goch <laughs> joke. So it's, it's one of the, you just have to, you just have to Google this, like right? Monty Python, L-L-A-P-G-O-C-H, lap and it, it'll show you the cartoon. It was an advert for a Welsh martial art. And this came out in like 1974, I think. So it was it was their really early Welsh martial art. And it was just such a hilarious, so fast, such a fast responder to this, this new thing that had just kicked off in cinema, this, this whole martial artsy thing. And, and it straight away knew that people were fetishizing the idea of Chinese or Japanese martial arts or Korean martial arts. And they were like, well, what's a funny place then. Well, Wales is a funny place, right? And what's a funny idea that there's a traditional Welsh martial art. And so Monty Python got there really fast. My interest in, um, in, martial, in, in martial arts comedy is, is to think about the way that martial arts conveys meaning or the way that it is understood in more mainstream and non-specialist concept uh, contexts, because context is king. So that, you know, I, I look less at the specific 
martial arts histories. I, I look less at specific martial arts books or martial arts manuals. I'm more interested in the way that martial arts registers within either mainstream or subcultural or, or comedic or, or whatever kinds of contexts. You know, so because that tells you a lot about what people think about martial arts and therefore what kind of discursive status they have. And there are, and I tried in this book, uh, in The Invention of Martial Arts, to kind of plot, not a graph, but a sort of like some of the key kind of coordinates of the landscape of the ways that martial arts are represent, like what they can mean, you know, what kind of figure embodies you know, martial arts in this context, well, you know, who is the MMA guy? And the, you've got the kind of Sherlock Holmes tradition of Artitsu Gent all the way through the Avengers and, and so on. So you still have that line of thought. And I kind of do the constellation of, of positions that martial arts seems to hold in, in mainstream discourses. Um, but I also think that there's something inherently hilarious about people trying and I think that if you look at a lot of the comedy about martial arts, like you never see Jason Bourne training. Jason Bourne just embodies, right? That he just is that skill. But you see, um, you see Napoleon Dynamite training, and it's a sign of like pathetic, needy, nerdy, teenage, boyish, like uh, you know this fantasy about I want to be like Bruce Lee, I want to be invincible. It's that effort. When you've mastered something, then maybe you, there, potentially you could be represented if you're in the right kind of cinematic genre as somehow superlative but nine times out of ten it's gonna you're gonna look ridiculous you're an adult who does what it's like um peter lodge once said you know like martial arts are regarded in western culture as something really positive something that you should send your children to do and he said so the implication therefore is there's something you should grow out of um, so in Western popular culture, you know, adults who do martial arts, th there's something wrong with them. They've either got a screw loose or they're fantasists or they're eternal kind of teenage boys or, or something like that, which I think is unfair in many cases. <laughs> you know, or you know since you brought that up, that leads perfectly into another thing that I have to, because I have you here on the computer, I have to pin you down to an answer to this because it's something that we've actually gone back and forth on face-to-face -face in stuff we've written about and it showed up here again. So I can't not talk about it. And it's the idea of realism in martial arts movies. It's always been an eternally interesting issue to me, something that we've both written about in a lot of different contexts. Even at one point, just for people who aren't in our tiny little two-person bubble talking about the same stuff, in an earlier book of Paul's theorizing Bruce Lee, he made a certain argument about Bruce Lee versus Chuck Norris from The Way of the Dragon, and then who the hell are the dudes in Bridget Don Jones' diary? Hugh oh, yeah. Grant um, and someone else. Uh, in Bridget Jones' diary, you have the card on the bounder. I can't remember, you know. Colin Firth, I think. Yeah. I'm the film professor. I got to come up with the right names. So Hugh Grant and Colin Firth. That's right. Then in an essay of mine, I kind of pushed on that argument just to clarify a certain couple of points. And then you responded to that in an essay. Then you have this here. I was like, there's too much here. We got to talk about it today. So the idea that you put forth is that given the way that serious martial arts have been represented in sort of action movies and martial arts movies, there's a sense that it's not just real or it's not truly real because one of the things that are kind of repressed and the return of the repressed, then you find it in comedies, but nobody ever screws up. Nobody misses, nobody trips and falls, nothing goofy happens. So that's an element of real fighting, but you're not gonna see that when Bruce Lee's fighting Chuck Norris. He's not gonna trip and fall and hit his head on the side of the Roman Colosseum. That's not gonna work. But the problem that I always had is then when it gets to, well, because this is here, it's more real than that. And that I just want to push on a little bit just to clarify again, the concept of the context that I've always felt that depending on the context of this fight scene, a certain thing showing up will either determine realistic or unrealistic. So for me, my sense was always, it would not be realistic and it would be weird if Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris sucked at martial arts, if they mess up or trip and fall. Just like it would be weird if the Bridget Jones dudes who are pissed at each other suddenly go into really elegant and ornate poses and start doing amazing techniques. So it seems to me just 
that depending on the context, depending on the people who are fighting, depending on anything that's established about their characters, any training, training any skills, it seems like depending on the context, that's how we'll then determine, okay, this is realistic or more realistic versus less realistic, at least plausible. So I just want to discuss that and the eternally returning problem of the way the dragon versus Bridget Jones diary. Yeah, I lo- I, that's one of my favorite fight scenes of all time. Um, <laughs> because it'd be and I love it because it's so bad and it's like it's like you know two two educated kind of upper middle class English men um get into a fight and they haven't had a fight since school if ever and and it's just and they don't know anything about distancing or timing and they're like oh and oh and it's just magnificent um and, and what interests me about that is that it's it's like because it is like the flip side of a of a Bruce Lee fight or a Jason Bourne fight um, or a James Bond fight or something like that. And uh, but obviously, I mean, I, you never forget that a film is a film and a film is a construct and a film has the genre conventions to play to and to respect or to 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 explore. Um, with with the Bruce Lee stuff, I would never well maybe I have but if I did I did so accidentally kind of generalize a concept of realistic as if that translated into from uh, off the screen into the real world because I think that when people my argument about Bruce Lee and my argument about many martial arts films is that martial arts aficionados watch them as documentaries Um, and so what you take away from Bruce Lee uh, choreography is what lots of sports people athletes boxers have said they've learned how to they learned how to communicate power. They learned how to put power into techniques because Bruce Lee kind of, you kind of go, look what he's doing. Look, the, the kind of compression and the kind of boom he's putting into it. So people watch those lesson, those, those fights as lessons. Most Bruce Lee fight scenes have a strong pedagogical, didactic or allegorical or symbolic dimension to them. And the fight with Chuck Norris is about how to have a fight like it's about how to overcome strictures and conventions and how to flow and all the rest of it um but i think that there's a you if you follow the logic of fidelity and truth it kind of takes you on these interesting arcs and to do some interesting paradoxes for instance after the one car Wai film came out the grandmaster and you have um, Ip Man fighting Gong Er, and and the first fight with, with Ip Man and Gong Er is a really interesting fight where he is like perfect Wing Chun, and she's she's kind of like Bagua, and and she has so her stance is different to his, and his is very his what's his his is that, and and halfway through the and they do all techniques perfectly, like perfectly, like a kata, like a daolu, like perfect, right, and that gives it a sense of unreality, even though technically. It's perfect, it's real, it's real martial arts, but it's so perfect that it's unreal. And then halfway through the fight, and you could only know this if you know what Wing Chun and Bagua look like, they change styles, she changes to his stance, and he goes, oh, and he's just in the briefest flicker of an, oh, and so he changes to her stance. But like, you don't know that unless you know about martial arts. It's it's a hyper real martial arts piece of choreography you couldn't get better in a in a in a in any choreographed performance in the world um so i'm more interested in and in, in the way that people try to people try to get to reality so the hollywood version might be to make it more scrappy and messy and shake the camera about a bit like in the way that david bordwell says you know shake the camera about to fudge over the fact that nobody knows what the hell's going on here (laughs) whereas the chinese or or hong kong cinematic tradition would be more like no i'm going to show you every single detail to show you how authentic this is leon hunt writes a lot about this kind of stuff um, but then if you think about, if you translate that into real martial arts practice, which is which is in the dojo or, or the gym or the wherever you are, these are highly artificial environments that people are trying to, to, to work out how to affect the real sometimes. Like, let's make it really like we're in the octagon, like we're really training for this competition or we're really training for the street, but they're still like studios. They're still, they're still realms of simulation and, and attempts to get to the real. But the real is kind of constantly deferred because it's a constantly shifting goalpost. The real is like, you know, difference as Derrida would have it. Um, so reality, whenever I've written about it, is normally something 
that is so I always go back to these kind of Derridian concepts. It's like a hauntological concept. It's not it's not an ontological concept. It's like, oh my God, but really what happens if? Really, what happens if I'm in the pub? What happens if I've got my children with me? What happens if I've got my computer in my bag? Like, really, how will I fight? Really, how will I react? And that really is more like an emotional appeal to something that is is more or less permanently deferred. Um, you realize I'm just basically quoting kind of English Derrida at you here now. <laughs> Other than I'm the bit how about- polite I'm being. <laughs> <laughs> There's loads of comments, There's 23 comments. Is there anything that we need to know about in the, I haven't read them obviously because I've been yakking.